Good morning, everybody, and welcome to church. Now, more than ever, it's such a pleasure to be able to gather together either in person or online. That's the beauty of the Capital C Church. It's not about the building, it's about the people coming together to worship Jesus. If you're online, make sure to grab some elements to serve as communion. That would be bread or something bread-like and juice or something juice-like. Church fam, we have really easy ways to get connected here. There's a QR code on the screen or on the chair back in front of you that will take you to a link to fill out a connect card, prayer card, or to sign up to get our weekly email news blasts. We're excited to get connected with you all. Good morning, good morning, welcome to UCC. Let's stand, let's get on our feet wherever you may be, both in person or online. Let's celebrate the wondrous God that we have, our God who we can call Father, who is creator. Let's sing these words together. Have you ever seen the wonder in the glimmer of differently through his eyes I see the world your way I'm not afraid to follow I see the world your way I'm not ashamed to say so I see the Jesus way and I'm walking in the light I see the world in life I see the world in wonder I see the world in life bursting in living color. I see the world your way, and I'm walking in light. Oh, I say, I see the world in grace. I see the world.
Good morning, NAM. How are you doing? Oh, I want just, I, it was really loud. It was perfectly sufficient, but I think we just need a little bit more today. It's cold. It's dreary. How you doing? There you go. I love to hear that. Hey, we are so glad that you're here with us today. If you're joining us in person or online, thank you for joining us today. I want to start out this morning uh, in a, a little bit of a different way. We love starting out with a lot of energy, but I also wanted us to center our hearts and our minds and focus our thoughts on God today. And so if you would bow your, eye, bow your heads, close your eyes with me if you are joining us online or in person, and let's just begin in prayer this morning. God, we give thanks that you are a God who listens to us, who hears us, that though you created the universe, that you are with us and that you are guiding us. Lord, we give thanks for your love. We give thanks for your patience with us. And Lord, we just pray that you continue to be patient with us, that you continue to show us your ways, the right ways, that you continue to guide us in truth, and that during this time and during our lives, this week as we interact with the people around us, our neighbors, our family members, that we can carry with us your hope and your truth. Lord, these things we pray in your name, amen, amen. Hey, once again, we are so glad that you are here joining us today. If you are online here in just a little bit, we're gonna have a time of communion. This is something that we do every week here at UCC, and so we would love for you, if you are, are watching us regularly, to have that ready at the beginning of service every week, but if this is your first time watching with us, go get something that is bread-like or juice-like. We're not particular. We just want you to be able to participate with us as we continue on in the service. So go ahead and get something that can represent the body of Christ and the blood of Christ as we take communion later on in service. We are in our third week of our Love Your Neighbor series. We're super excited about all that God has for us as we push ourselves out of our comfort zones to interact and love our neighbors. Um, today, Pastor Chris is gonna be bringing the message for us today, but for now, let's stay standing and let's continue to celebrate and worship our God today. Last week, we learned a new song. We're gonna sing it again today. Let's have some fun and let's celebrate our God. Let's give him all the glory today.
important in our lives. Amen. Amen. Beside me you have always been And when in pride I've pushed away It's your mercy that has pulled me in You won't walk away won't give me up I know your grace has forgiven much You call
Again, we're coming to a time of communion, so if you are joining us online and want to get those elements ready and you have not already, go ahead and get those together. If you are here in person on your chair, there should have been a small um, little cup that was prepackaged for you. If you want to go ahead and get that ready, it's okay for you to go ahead and open the top and get the uh, piece of bread or wafer ready for you to eat. Sometimes they can take a little while, and I want you to be able to take those with us when we're taking them together. We come to this time of communion, and it has uh, the frequency with which we do communion always is comforting sometimes to me, but it also gives me an opportunity to view it anew, to be reminded every week when I reflect on my week and I reflect on my actions, my faith, my walk with Jesus, and it allows me to remember not every week is the same, and not every week do I come to church and, and I am just excited because God has been doing amazing things. Sometimes I have been pushing away. We all go through these seasons. And what I love about communion is it's a time for me to remember that regardless of how inconsistent I am, that God's grace is always there with us, for us. And he is there not just every week, but every day and every moment, offering his mercy to us. His kindness is truly amazing, and it is something that I think my entire life I will never fully quite understand. And that's part of the amazing thing about God is that we can spend our lives every day trying to understand his love, his mercy more and more. But because he's God, we will never quite understand the depth of love that he has for us. And it's that love that we come to remember and to celebrate in these moments every week, this time that we call communion. See, God loved us so much that he sent the thing that was most precious to him, his only son, to be a sacrifice for us, for the things that we have done wrong, for the sins that we have. We knew that there was a debt to pay, and instead of making us pay it, which was only fair, he said, I'll pay it for you. I love you, and I want to be with you. And that's what we're here to remember is that God loved us so much that he paid our debt, that we may not perish, but have everlasting life. And so if you wanna get those elements together, I didn't take my own advice and didn't open the top layer before I started. If you wanna get the bread ready together. And take this in remembrance of Jesus' body broken for you. Go ahead and get the cup ready or juice or whatever you have available at home. And let's drink this in remembrance of his blood shed for us. Please pray with me. God, we give thanks for your mercy and we give thanks for your grace. Thank you for this reminder that you are a God who loves us, that we may forget, that we may pull away from you. Lord, we know that you are always pursuing us. Let us live our lives in pursuit of your love, of your mercy, and of the example that you set for us in Jesus Christ. Lord, these things we pray in your name. Amen. Hey, UCC family. We are Grant and Allie Ford, making disciples and forming churches in Southeast Asia. It is such an honor to be supported by you, UCC. We are excited to share about what Jesus is doing overseas. One of our close national friends that we got the chance to share the gospel with has decided to follow Jesus. We're now training her on how to make disciples who make disciples. She's already begun sharing Jesus with her family, friends, and even strangers. We also have two national churches that are being trained by our team in disciple-making tools. Hundreds in our city are now being trained to further Jesus' kingdom there. Jesus is the best thing that's ever happened to us, church, and he is exalting himself through your partnership right now on the other side of the world. Thank you. We love you, family. We miss you, UCC. Our God is alive and on the throne. Let's go out and make him known here and around the world. Amen.
mission of UCC is to love God, love people, and bring the two together. And it's that mission that we can accomplish because of the resources that we have to be able to accomplish it. Every week, there are things going on. As someone who works in this church, who is uh, deeply into everything that is happening, I still cannot tell you everything that happens every week, every ministry that is having... um, some amazing breakthroughs, Some ha- is doing amazing things to be able to reach people for Christ, to be able to reach students for Christ, to be able to breathe into families and children here in this church, the people who are emailing, the people who are sending letters and calling. I literally cannot tell you everything that is happening. I can tell you some of the things I know maybe might be happening. And it is truly amazing that people in this church are working to be able to love God and to love people and to be able to introduce them together, to let them know who Jesus is. And it is because of your support that those things are possible. It's because of that support that we're able to not just do it here in our community, uh, in Gary County and in Wamigo, but we can do it all across the globe. We can send people who grow up here, who went to college here, much like the Fords, who went to Manhattan Christian College in K-State, and they leave this town, and it is always difficult to see them leave. But they leave this town on mission, and they leave this town ready to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, and it is that ministry that you support every week when we give together here at UCC. If you do wanna give with us today, there are a few different ways that you can give. You can give online at any point in time, university.church slash give. That's how me and my family, we give with that. We um, set it and forget it. And um, we have that come out of our paycheck and we update it whenever we need to from time to time. That's how we choose to give. If you wanna give uh, every week, you can also choose that as well. You can also give with a text message anywhere, whether you are joining us online or in person, you can uh, text that number on the screen and bring hope, all one word. It doesn't matter whether it's capitalized or not, and you can be able to go through that uh, step-by-step process to give that way as well. If you want to give, you can always drop off an offering at our offering drop boxes here on campus or at our office any time of the week, and if you need any help with any of that, please just call our office. We are happy to help. Um, it truly is something that we cannot do without your, your help, your partnership, and we are so thankful for the many people who have faithfully given, not just through this, this season, but through the years who have been able to provide a space and set up an infrastructure where we are able to continue to minister to th- people online all across the country and all cl- across the globe to keep people connected, to keep families worshiping together through deployments, through sickness. We are so thankful for your support And if you do want to give again today, you can give in any of those ways. We've got some church news that we would love to share with you. So if you want to take a look together, let's take a look at this church news. UCC is having its first ever trunk or treat this Friday, October 30th, from 6.30 to 8.30 in the upper parking lot. This is a great opportunity for kids of all ages to come with their parents to play games, collect candy, and see a fun presentation of the gospel using a jack-o'-lantern. We are taking measures to provide a safe environment for families and masks will be required. We are very excited about this event, but in order to make it possible, we will need your help. If you'd like to volunteer for this event, please visit our website, university.church events, or you can go to the serve tab on our UCC hub app and select trunk or treat under events. Again, this will be this Friday, October 30th from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. Hey friends, just a little reminder, next week is Daylight Savings, the best one though. So we thought Daylight Savings time was the best time to throw you for an additional loop and change our 9.20 service time to 9.30. This will be a permanent change, so starting next week, November 1st, our service times will be 8, 9.30, and 11. And if you forget, you'll just be a little bit early, so it'll be no big deal. Other than scanning that QR code, you can keep up with us through our social media platforms. Like us on Facebook, follow our Instagram, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and as always, check out our website at university.church. It's a beautiful day in this neighborhood, a beautiful day for a neighbor. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? Would you be mine? Would you be my neighbor?
Well, good morning. It's good to be back in the building with you guys. Uh, I've been gone for a couple weeks now. My family and I had a beautiful baby girl. Her name is Eliza about two weeks ago. And so, uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> thank you. Um, so I've been out for a minute, and uh, we're excited in, in, to invite her into our home and welcome her into our home. But uh, what that means is uh, more joy and more chaos in our house and a lot less sleep. So um, if, if the things I say today don't sound coherent, just pray that God would reveal you these things to you via the Spirit, because uh, it's been a, a little bit of lack of sleep. But uh, I'm excited to be back and, and, and preaching in this series that we're in called Love Your Neighbor. And the idea comes, uh, we kind of got the Mr. Rogers theme, but it comes from this book, The Art of Neighboring. And in this book, the, the pastor, Dave Runyon, who, who writes this book, uh, he's a pastor out in Colorado, and the whole idea was like, when Jesus said that second greatest commandment was to love your neighbor as yourself, um, what if he actually meant like those literally our neighbors, the, the literal neighbors that we have that are in close proximity to us on a day-to-day -day basis. And so uh, he kind of unpacks this idea and then unpacks the story of the Good Samaritan where uh, we find out like who is my neighbor and Jesus uh, unpacks through that story of, of who the neighbor is and, and about loving and serving. And so this whole series we've been talking about, uh, what does it look like to love our neighbors and to share Jesus with our neighbors and model Jesus to them by how we uh, live our lives and how we interact. But also, uh, what if it means our actual neighbors? And what if you and I aren't in the place that we're in just by coincidence or happenstance, but that maybe Jesus actually wants to use you and to use me right where he has us to, to reach those that he's put around us on a day-to-day -day basis. And so today we're going to talk about some real practical application steps of like what would it look like to do that and to actually love and serve those neighbors of ours. And how, how, how could we love them, serve them, and begin to develop a relationship with them for the ultimate goal that we would be able to share Jesus with our neighbors, to share how he's impacted our lives and changed our lives and our stories and transformed us. And so what would it look like to bless them? And we're going to walk through uh, what I mean when I say bless here, here in a little bit. But today, if you have your Bibles, Colossians chapter 4. We're going to be in Colossians chapter 4, and Paul is going to be uh, giving us some real practical advice and wisdom uh, today on how we are to carry out this idea of loving our neighbors. And so Paul is, in, when he's writing this, he's in Roman prison. And so he's in Roman prison, and, and we're going to see why, but he's writing to the church at Colossae, and he's giving them some instructions as to how they're to live around uh, outsiders, you would call it, or unbelievers, those who don't yet know Jesus. So let's jump in and read real quick. It says, Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ, on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear, which is how I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. So Paul, something to catch here as he opens up uh, this, this part of Colossians is um, he starts with this idea of prayer. And there's three assumptions that we need to know that Paul makes. And, and the first is this, is that he says to be steadfast in prayer. And what Paul is saying there is he's making an assumption that we as followers of Jesus uh, already have a devout prayer life. He's making the assumption that, that we are already praying for those around us, that we're already praying uh, regularly to Jesus, that, that, that God would open up doors of opportunity. And he says, be steadfast. This is the same language that we see Jesus use in Luke 18 when he tells his disciples a story of, a, of an old woman who, um, she has a neighbor who has done uh, unjust things to her, and so she takes this to the judge, and Jesus paints this picture to his disciples and says, uh, she goes to the judge, but the judge won't grant her a fair ruling, and so she is steadfast and persistent, and day after day after day after day, she goes back to this judge and pleads her case, eventually to the point where she basically, Jesus says, uh, she annoys the judge, and he calls uh, the judge in the story an unjust judge, and to the point that the judge eventually grants her a fair and just ruling against her, uh, the person who has done wrong against her. But then what Jesus is painting here, the picture he's painting, he tells his disciples, then how much more would a just father 
grant the answer to our prayers when we pray rightly and when we pursue him steadfastly day in and day out. And so Paul's talking about as we're going to approach outsiders and think about how we can love and serve them, do you have a steadfast prayer life? And if you do, if you're praying uh, day in, day out, uh, constantly and persistently for them, that our, our God is, is joyous and he desires to answer our prayers. But Paul assumes, he says, we, we must have a steadfast prayer life. And the second one is this, is he says, uh, being watchful. As we pray, we're to be watchful and vigilant. And it's the same. He echoes uh, the, the language that Jesus is, uses when he invites Peter, James, and John into the garden with him on the night that he's betrayed. And he, he tells them to be watchful. He's asking them to be vigilant. And Paul's saying the same thing about our prayer life, that we would be watchful and vigilant, looking for the, the opportunities and, and the right times to, to have doors to share with our neighbors, to love them, to serve them, to reach out. And then the last part is that uh, here he says, uh, we watch on it with thanksgiving. So the third point that Paul's making here is, is simply this idea that when we pray steadfastly to God and we're being vigilant in our prayers for those around us, then uh, we're going to do it with thanksgiving because we know that God answers our prayers. We, we, we pray with gratitude because we know, uh, we pray expectantly knowing that God will answer our prayers and that this is his work to do, not, not our work. We pray, but God does the work of working out the answers to our prayers. And Paul says, so, so, so do so with gratitude. And then he's going to move on here. And so he says, pray for us that an open door would, would, that a door would open for the word that we could declare the mystery of Christ. And so Paul's in prison and he's, he's writing to this church and he's saying, and pray for us, but what we want you to pray for is not the fact that we're in prison, but he's, he wants you to pray for uh, the opportunity, that doors of opportunity would open up. And so uh, in the same way, as we're talking about loving our neighbors and loving those around us, are you praying for doors of opportunity to open up? The word that Paul uses here is he says uh, to share the word, but it's not simply just like scripture. The, the word in Greek there is logos. And so what that means is that that Greek word logos is actually this word, and it means that uh, it points to Jesus as the Messiah. It's the same uh, word that we see John open up his gospel with when he says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And this is why Paul's in prison, is because he's in a Roman prison, and uh, he, he has made claims that Jesus was the logos, the word, and because of that, he's saying Jesus is God. And because of these claims, he's been put into prison because what we know about Rome is that Caesars were seen as God and that they were the highest authority and power. And uh, to, to say that, that Jesus was the Messiah and that he was God made flesh, the God man on earth was in direct opposition. And so we see that this is, this is why Paul is in prison and in chains. But what Paul's saying is, would you pray for doors of opportunity that would open up for us to share Lagos, the word Jesus, with those around us? Paul, Paul, Paul says this, and he asks for open doors while he's in the Roman prison. And then he's going to, when he's asked for these open doors, he's going to then tell us and give us an example as to how we are to interact with those who are outsiders, for those who are unbelievers and not followers of Jesus. And so then in, in verse 5, we see Paul, and he starts this, he says, walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. And let your speech always be gracious and seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. So this is where it's going to get like really practical for us, because uh, at the end of the day, if, if, we, if we talk about this, but we don't have any practical use of how we, how we can apply this in our lives, uh, then we've fallen short. And so Paul gives us some very practical and wise advice as to how we are to uh, live and walk and, and, and uh, work amongst those who are not believers. And so for the sake of this series, how do we do that with our neighbors? And Paul's going to point us to this idea of walking in wisdom, and then he's going to talk about our speech and I don't know about you, but um, uh, for me personally, most of the folks that I know who are, are not followers of Jesus, who are non-believers, oftentimes don't have a problem with Jesus. 
Like, like most non-believers don't have a problem with Jesus. Oftentimes their problem is, is with those who would call themselves followers of Jesus that they've encountered, right? Like has anybody encountered somebody who uh, would call themselves a Christian, but they were just unbearable to be around? I, I know I have, and, and I know maybe even at times I've been that person unknowingly. And so uh, w- w- this is for free today, but a couple things I want to point out is when we're talking about walking in wisdom, what that looks like are, are, are two main things here is, is to be self-aware as followers of Jesus. To be self-aware, and what I mean by that is like, do you know how you're perceived by outsiders? Do you know how you're perceived by outsiders and how uh, you're, you're received by them with your interactions and your words? See, what I know about myself and what I've had to learn in time is this, that sometimes when I get into a room of people or into a crowd, I can come off, I can be a loud and boisterous person. I, I can come off as the person that I could just carry a conversation and run through things. But what I've also learned... <laughs> In my life and through marriage, God has used my beautiful wife to help refine me in this area is that sometimes I I can speak into things without being cautious or aware of where other people are at, right? Like I can speak out and say something to people who I don't really know and don't really have much of a relational context with, and I can say things. And when I do that, it has the tendency sometimes to uh, say things that shut people down. See, this is not walking in wisdom. And so in time, I've had to learn how to sit back and, as the Bible would say, uh, be quick to listen and slow to speak. I've had to uh, remember to hold my opinion and ask good questions. This is what it means to be self-aware as a follower of Jesus. Uh, I'm sure most of us can think of somebody that we know who is just that person that uh, you start a conversation with and they want to finish every single one of your sentences, right? But they think they're finishing your sentences and taking in the right direction, but uh, you meant to go right and they took it left, right? Like we've all encountered that person. If you're in here and you're like, I don't know what you're talking about, you might be that person. (laughs) You might be the person who takes a conversation left when it was meant to go right. And this is what I mean when Paul's talking about walking in wisdom. When I say to be self-aware, this is highly important for us as followers of Jesus is because the the quickest way to shut somebody down is to, to speak out of your opinion first without having any relational context and to say very, uh, certain things that, that may be in complete opposition to where they're at or lacking the grace that Paul talks about. So like in our day and age, maybe when you're having that conversation with your neighbor, your outsider, um, maybe your experience with this whole COVID thing hasn't been their experience. And so maybe instead of uh, spouting out at the mouth and and saying how you feel about COVID or the mask, regardless of how you feel or whether it's right or wrong, uh, instead of spouting out, we're just going to sit back and we're going to listen and we'll ask good questions. Maybe in this time where there's a, an election going on and, and uh, before we spout off about who we think is right or who we think is the best person for the job, we simply sit back and we listen and we ask good questions. This would be to walk in wisdom and have our words and our speech seasoned with graciousness and salt that's, that's palatable that people want to hear. And the second thing, the first would be self-awareness, and the second thing is simply this, is um, if we're going to love our neighbors, we have to have a genuine care and concern for the person over our opinion. Like as followers of Jesus, we have to care more about the person who lives across the street or lives next door or on our dorm floor or in the apartment across the way. We actually have to care about them as a person made in the image of God more than we care about the, our personal opinions, more than we care about the name that's on the sign in their yard or the name that's on the sign in our yard. We have to care and to love them and have grace and compassion on them. And so you might be asking yourself, okay, Chris, what's... What's the point here? Like, how does this all tie together with uh, this Love Your Neighbor series? And the the point is this, is today I said was going to be practical. And so we want to walk through just the practical application of of how we share Jesus with our neighbors. 
Because as Paul says, we're praying steadfastly. We're asking for doors to open up to share the word Jesus with our neighbors. And so we're going to do that. But this is important to to lay that foundation and groundwork first. Because uh, oftentimes, if you want to share Jesus with somebody around you, and we miss all these things, it's, it's going to be met with a lot of reluctance. Some of you might be in the room today or watching online and, and you're not a believer. And, and the very reason you're not a believer is because of your experience with believers. And so today, that's what we're talking about is how do we practically do this in a way that's wise and receivable. And so today, the, the, the first uh, part of this is we have this acronym BLESS. And this is simply a tool for evangelizing, a tool for sharing Jesus' story and your Jesus' story with your neighbor. And the first letter here is B, and it means begin in prayer. And so just as Paul said, we're going to be steadfast in prayer. But the B of blessed means to begin in prayer. So as we, we talked about in week one, we, we gave out the magnets. And the whole idea be- behind those magnets was that you would simply put it on your fridge and then begin to know your neighbor's name. And so it's, it, you can pray for your neighbor even while they're a stranger, but um, it gets a lot easier when you know their name, as Barry pointed out in week one. And so we've got these magnets so that you can begin in prayer and start taking down their names and begin to pray for those around you by name. And then the second piece is this, is that we would, it's the L, that we would then listen to our neighbors, that we would listen to those around us and, and listen and ask good questions and gain some context on their life. And now, because we're praying for them by name and then we're listening in conversation and being vigilant and watchful for opportunities to step in and interact with them and to love them and to serve them, we begin to not only know their name, but then we begin to know their need. And so we're going to be uh, listening to them, and this is how we learn to pray for them, uh, not only by name but by need. And then this next letter, E, is one of my favorites. It's eat with them. (laughs) It's eat with them. Like, this is very simple and practical. Like, we get the opportunity to uh, share Jesus with our neighbors simply through eating. And if you, uh, here's what I love about Jesus. Like, uh, he's my kind of guy because every time uh, he's talking with non-believers in the Bible, he basically ends up inviting himself to their house for a meal. He's like, hey, let's go eat at your place. Like, that's a dude I can get along with, right? Okay? So Jesus simply says, but we see him tabling with people as he shares truth with them. The thing that I know about sitting at the dinner table and eating with people is this, is some of the best conversations I've had in my life and some of the best connections I've made in my life have been around a table with friends. And so this third step is simply to eat with your neighbors. And maybe you're like, "Uh, that's awkward. I'm not the kind of person that wants to invite somebody in my house. That's fine. I hope that someday we would get to that place where we could invite them into our home But if not, then maybe you just start with a coffee. Or you say, hey, would you go out to dinner with us? And I just want to get to know you better and connect and learn some more of your story. And as we eat with him, we walk in wisdom, we watch our speech, and we simply ask good questions and gain some context for their life. And then what begins to happen is you now know that, okay, so your neighbor, and he has that son, and his son's been back at home a lot more lately And there's some things going on, and you begin to gain some context. And then the next time, because we're being vigilant and watchful, the next time you see Mike, your neighbor, you could say, hey, Mike, how's that thing going with your son? How have those talks been going with your wife? How's the thing with your kids? See this, when we begin to table with people and eat with them, this is what happens as we begin to build that connection and relationship with people. And the first S is this, is that we would serve them. So we've been praying, and and we're praying devoutly and steadfastly for them. We're being watchful for opportunities. We're listening to hear their story. And and now we've began to connect with people. But we're going to look for opportunities to serve our neighbor. And so I don't know what that looks like in your neighborhood. Maybe you're in a dorm or an apartment, and it looks a little different. Or maybe you're, you're on a street or cul-de-sac, and maybe it just looks like uh, you have an elderly neighbor, and you, you can take their paper that gets thrown at the end of the driveway up to their door. 
Or maybe the, the snow's hit the ground and uh, you, you, you wake up a little extra early and you shovel their driveway or throw down some salt for them. I don't know what it looks like. Maybe your neighbor's like us and they've just had a baby and they're not sleeping at all. <laughs> and so you just bring a meal. Like a number of people here from the church have just brought meals for Kirsten and I. And, I mean, it has been more of a blessing than you know so that we can simply spend time with our kids and do the things we need to do. But maybe your neighbor has a baby and they just need you to drop off a meal and love and care. I don't know what it looks like in your context, but we're being watchful in our prayers and asking God, God to open up doors of opportunity to not only share the word, but to serve them. And the last S is this, is, is that you share your story. The last S is that we're going to share our story with them. And when I say share your story, we're going to share our Jesus story with them of how Jesus has impacted us and transformed and changed our life. And I know some of you are like, this is awkward, and this is the part that it gets awkward and weird for you, and you don't know how to do that. And, and I understand that I've, I've been there myself. But here's the deal is I gave you the BLESS acronym because this last S of sharing your story gets a whole lot easier when you've done the first four things. When you've actually prayed for them by name and need and you've listened to them and you, you, you know what's going on in their life and you've tabled with them or eaten with them and had connection with them and you've served them, I can promise you this, doors of opportunity will begin to open up and this gets a lot less awkward because you've already laid the foundation and done the groundwork to build connection with them that those doors may open up, that they may have a desire to hear your Jesus story. And maybe you're thinking, I, 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 can, I can do those first four, I just don't know how to do them. I don't know how to do that last one, like how to share my story. And, and that, that's, that's okay. We have resources on our app where you can go and download a PDF and simply just write out your story and practice writing it out and getting it in plain and clear words of how Jesus has transformed your life, what your life was like before you met Jesus, and what it's like since you've met Jesus. Uh, John, our discipleship pastor, he, he is, has gone to, and, and not just him, but, but he primarily does this, is goes to life groups and will lead your life group through a training of how do you share your story? What does that look like and how to do that? And lastly, we wanted to give a real practical way. So next, next week at 920 in the garage, in the gathering place here at the church, we're going to have a share your story lab where we're just going to walk through a practical training of how do you share your Jesus story when God opens up those doors that we've been praying for. You see, here, here's the thing is when, when we get to this place where we share our story, with our neighbor that from there, we, we've done the work to that point. From there, it's God's work. The, the work from that point on is for him to do. It's not on you to save your neighbor. You and I can't save our neighbors. I can't save anyone. I, I, I could barely make it to church without like yelling at a child, right? It's not on us to save anyone. We simply have to share our story and that gets a whole lot easier when we've done these other steps. Here's the thing is, for a lot of us, we start here. Like, like some of us, that, that person across the street or across the hallway or, or, or you know, around us next door, they're, they're not even a neighbor at this point. They're just a stranger. And so we're going to take baby steps and it's why we gave the magnet is because then you can maybe, it's, it's the holiday time. And it doesn't matter if you've been next to somebody for 16 years and you don't know their name. They probably don't know yours. But, but take some cookies for the holidays. Look for an opportunity to serve them and simply ask their name. Push past the awkward, as Barry talked about in the first week. Let's get past the awkward and say, hey, I'm sorry, I don't, I know I should know your name, but my name's Chris. Nice to meet you. Here's some cookies. And then they go from stranger to acquaintance. And then we're prayerful and we're watchful and we're vigilant for more opportunities to simply talk to them, to serve them. And then they go from acquaintance to neighbor. 
end. Then we begin to do the work of blessing them and we're listening to their story and we've invited them in and now we're tabling with them and they go from neighbor to friend. You see, these steps, it's just baby steps and they truly, they're not that difficult. If we would just take one step at a time, like, hey, stranger, my name's Chris and now they're an acquaintance. And you begin to look for opportunities to serve them and ask them questions, and they become more of a neighbor. And they move from neighbor to friend. And then the best part of this is, is that we do all of this work to, to get them to this point. And now that we've worked through the blessed thing and we've shared our story with them, this bottom part is it's, it's God's work to do, as I said. We simply work them through the baby steps from stranger to acquaintance to neighbor and then we're tabling with friends and we share how Jesus has transformed our life with them. And and it goes back to the question I asked beginning of what if you are where you are for a reason? What if Jesus wants to use you and your story to take those who are next door across the street from you, from friend to follower? What if he wants to use you? Yes, you. Not me, not, not, not somebody on the pastoral team, not somebody else, not the guy down the street that you know is a believer, but what if he wants to use you to take them from friend to follower? That would be a beautiful day in the neighborhood. Would you pray with me? God, we love you. We thank you. We thank you for being a a God who loves us and, and who gives us clear and simple, easy steps to just take as people, to make connections and build friendships and relationships, Lord, and that you do the work of saving people, that that's not on our shoulders. We simply just get to share what we know is true about you in our lives and how that's transformed and changed us. God, I pray for those in the room, those online, as we've worked to try and get to know our neighbors better. Lord, would you, would you let us see some of the fruit of that work? Help us to push past the awkward and to turn neighbors, strangers into neighbors and neighbors into friends. And God, would you do the work of turning friends into followers? It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Let's stand and continue to worship our God today. We talk about sharing our story, our stories and the testimony of Jesus Christ and what he has done in our lives. Let's sing this together. Darkness run for cover, but the miracle that I just can't get over, my name is registered in heaven. I believe in signs and wonders. I have resurrection power. Yes, I do. Still the miracle that I just can't get over. Sons and daughters, bought with blood and washed in water. Sing the praises of the Spirit, Son and Father. Our God will finish what He started. Yes, our God will finish what He started. Oh, this is my testimony from death to life. 
Bye. 